Moving on from stock take now, we're going to take a look at uh, the um, difficult subject of um, stock impairment, the difficult subject of damaged stock and slow moving goods which we were just discussing just a moment ago. And the question for that is a, a lovely question called Silver Hill. Now, Silver Hill also possesses um, a, a section on what's called stock cutoff, which is to do with the timing and recognition of stock. So let's have a look at uh, the question Silver Hill. So let's have a look at the question Silver Hill, which deals with cut-off at the year end. Uh, your firm is the auditor of Silver Hill Potteries, which is a wholesaler of pottery products, e.g. cups, saucers, plates, mugs, etc. And you are carrying out the audit for the year ended 30th of April. You have been asked by the senior in charge of the audit, uh, the audit, the, well, you have been asked by the senior in charge of the audit, the audit, to carry out checks on cut-off and identify uh, stock which may be worth less than cost and to check that it has been valued correctly. Um, the company has computerized stock control system which records receipts and dispatches of stock, uh, current stock quantities and the age of the stock. You attended a stock count of all stock at the year end. Um, again, it's just a scenario telling you that they have a system, basically. So not a great deal in that particular scenario. A. Um, you're required to explain the procedures uh, you would perform to confirm that stock, sales and purchases cut-off is accurate. Um, uh, cut-off is all about recognising goods in the correct period. Um, there's two types of cut-off. Uh, there's uh, purchases cut-off for goods coming inwards and then the sales cut-off for goods going outwards. Now, the thing is about accounting systems is, a, is accounting systems are based on bits of paper. They are um, derived by um, recording uh, purchase invoices and sales invoices. They're based on bits of paper. But the truth of the matter is, is you don't actually make a sale when you send the sales invoice. You make a sale when you send the goods. You don't make a purchase when they send you the invoice. That's not when a purchase takes place. A purchase takes place when you receive the goods. But when you record the purchase is when you receive the invoice. It is therefore possible for you to make a purchase but not record it. If they send you the goods then you receive the goods, right? But if your system is based upon pieces of paper, then you won't record that purchase until the goods, until the purchase invoice is received by your accountant. When your purchase invoice is received by the accountant, the, per the accountant will stick it onto the purchase day book. It'll go from the purchase day book into the general ledger and be recognised as a liability. When you get the purchase invoice, that is when you'll recognise the purchase. But it's not the right time. When you make the purchase is when you get the goods. Yeah, so what? Well, what can happen is you can get the goods, but not the invoice, and then the year end falls. Like a year end. Like a year end. Exactly like a year end. So, if you receive the goods in this period, but you receive the invoice in the next period, then what would be the effect on your accounting records? Well, if you receive the goods in this period, you have made a purchase. But if you get the invoice next period, you'll record the purchase next period. Now, never mind about next period. We don't really care about next period. The problem is, we did make a purchase and it's not being recorded. What is the name of this error? The name of this error is a hacha, a cut-off error. And it is so common, it involves a great deal of detailed testing. Um, which is really easy, really boring, but um, really important. Um, there's two different types of cut-off error, and therefore two different types of cut-off 
procedure. There's the um, purchases um, cut-off procedures, and then there's the sales cut-off procedures. And for purchases, you just sample a whole load of purchase invoices before the year end and after the year end. And then for the sales um, cut-off, you test a whole load of goods dispatch notes before the year end and after the year end. And that's basically it. But that only gives you four marks and there's five. Well, there's a little bit more just at the end, a little bit technical just at the end for that fifth mark. But let's lay it out and see what you think. So, first of all, we're going to have pre-year end um, goods received notes. Pre-year end goods received notes. I would sample a number of goods received notes GRN pre year end and verify that the transaction is included in inventory purchases and payables I would sample a number of goods received notes uh, pre-year end and verify the transaction is included in inventory purchases and payables I mean let's face it if we have a goods received note before the year end. We must have received the goods before the year end. If we received the goods before the year end, well, we got them before the year end. So they should be in stock. They should be in purchases, and we owe for them as well. So they should be in um, creditors. They should be in payables. And the post year end test is almost exactly the same, just with a slight twist in the sentence. I would sample a number of goods received notes post year end and verify that the transaction is excluded from those three. Post year end GRN. I would sample a number of GRN after the year end and verify the transaction is excluded from Inventory, payables, and purchases. I would sample a number of GRN after the year end and verify the transaction is excluded from inventory, payables, and purchases. Because if the goods received note was received after the year end, then the goods must have been received after the year end. If they were received after the year end, then it's nothing to do with us. That's next year's audit. In which case, it shouldn't be on this year's financial statements at all. And it's similar with the other system, which is the sales system, the output cut off. Pre year end GDN. I would sample 
a number of goods dispatch notes pre year end and verify the transaction is included in sales and receivables but excluded from inventory. It's a bit more complicated this one, isn't it? I would sample a number of goods dispatch notes um, for sales, of course, for output, pre-year end, so it's before the year end, and verify the transaction is included in sales and receivables. Well, obviously, if you've dispatched the goods, then you've dispatched the goods. And a sale is recognised at the point of delivery, not at the point that you send the invoice. Uh -uh. Not at the point that you send the invoice, but at the point you send the goods. When you make a sale is when you send the goods. And if we've sent the goods, we've made a sale. If we've made a sale, it should be in sales. And receivables, it should be in debtors as well. But hang on, if you've sent the goods, then you've sent the goods. So those goods should be excluded from stock. And it's the same, but the other way around as regards the other one. So it's post, year end, G, D, N. Post, year end, G, D, N. I would sample a number of uh, GDN after the year end and verify the transaction is excluded from um, excluded from sales and purchases no that's wrong sales and uh, receivables but included in stock well, that's a bit harder that one but check it out. Um, the goods were dispatched, but they were dispatched after the year end. If they were dispatched just after the year end, then presumably they must have been in stock at the year end. So a just post year end dispatch should be in stock. But obviously, if the dispatch takes place after the year end, then the goods are going out after the year end. If the goods are going out after the year end, then they didn't go out this year. If they didn't go out this year, you didn't sell them this year. If you didn't sell them this year, they shouldn't be in sales. And of course, if they shouldn't be in sales, they shouldn't be in debtors either. So that's the basic four ideas as regards cutoff. You basically, ha you take the year end and then you've got the pre-period, and the post period for both purchases, the input system, and sales, the output system, giving you effectively a matrix of uh, four different tests that you need to do. You need to do um, GRN before the year end, GRN after the year end. You need to do GDN before the year end and GDN after the year end, giving you four separate tests that you need to do. And, and that portfolio of tests together is called cutoff or at least basic cutoff. Now, here's a, complex trans, uh, here's a complex transactional idea. Here's a complex um, audit idea. 
that I'm just going to touch on for just one mark, but it's possibly worth being aware of, because you never know, this could get examined. It is a little bit advanced, but it could get examined. It's, it's worth mentioning. Um, it's called directional testing. Now, um, one tends to imagine that the financial statements are the pinnacle of financial reporting, not unreasonably. So the financial statements are kind of at the top of the pyramid. The financial statements are at the top of the pyramid. And at the bottom of the pyramid is the base records, producing layer by layer by layer information which flows into the top of the uh, financial reporting pyramid, which is the FS themselves. Now, we're grubbing around at the bottom of the financial records, uh, down here in goods received notes. But I want you to take a look at the direction that we're going. Uh, goods received notes, let's do purchases. Goods received notes uh, generate, um, uh, uh, well, they just generate goods received notes. But uh, goods received notes match to purchase invoices. And then the purchase invoices goes into the purchase day book. The purchase day book then goes into the purchases ledger and the general ledger. And from the general ledger, you get the trial balance. And from the trial balance, you get the financial statements at the top, right? So that's, that's the flow of information from the bottom to the top. But anyway, back here, what we've just done is we've done a direction of audit testing. What we've done is we've gone right down to the bottom and picked up a goods receive note and checked it to a purchase invoice. So for each goods received note, there should be a purchase invoice. There should be a liability in the FS. Okay? That direction is known as up. But hang on, shouldn't we just test it the other way as well? Directional testing tends to be lopsided, so you do a lot of up and a little bit of down, is the way it tends to be. But I'll write it down and see if you can see the opposite direction, see how it looks. Opposite direction. We should also sample a number of uh, purchases liabilities and sales receivables and verify the existence of a related G, D, N, and G, have I done that right? No. Let's get that the other way around. G, R, N, and G, D, N, in the appropriate period. It is a little bit complex, this, I must admit. Directional testing is something that you may find useful, but it may be completely useless to you, and it, is, it isn't an enormously uh, important concept. But it is true that what we have been doing so far has been unidirectional. We've taken the GRNs and we've confirmed that the GRNs, we've sampled the GRNs and confirmed that the GRNs have related purchase invoices. What we should do now is sample a few purchase invoices and make sure that they've got related GRNs. Now, of course, if the purchase invoice is recognised as a liability in the current FS, if the purchase invoice is a liability in the current FS, then we should have received the goods before the year end, in which case it should have a pre-year end GRN. And that's what we're testing there. So we sample a whole load of purchase invoices and make sure that the GRN is in the right period. We sample a whole load of sales invoices and make sure that the 
GDN is in the right period. And that's down. That's testing from the upper record, the purchase invoice, down to the lower record, the GRN. That's called down direction. Uh, it's complicated that, I do accept. But um, if we don't mention it, we're going to end up with unidirectional testing. So now we have directional testing put into our cutoff, which is fantastic. Uh, the rest of this question then moves on to a completely different subject. So we've left cutoff ha behind and we start to look at stock valuation. Now, stock valuation is a massive thing because you can have damaged goods and you can have obsolete goods. And if that is the case, then your, your stock will not be worth its cost. And that draws us nicely into Part B. Part B looks at the financial reporting, the uh, international accounting standard as regards stock. And uh, we'll look at Part B now. So define in detail the basis for valuing stocks in accordance with international financial reporting standards. So inventory. Inventory. is valued at the lower of cost and NRV. Inventory is valued at the lower of cost and NRV on an individual stock by stock item basis. Well that can't possibly be three marks and of course it's not. Cost Cost is all past expenditure in bringing the inventory to its present location and condition. Uh, cost is all past expenditure in bringing the inventory to its present location and condition. And NRV is net realizable value, which is literal. Net realizable value is the future expected sale price, which is basically market value, isn't it? So market value, what you expect to get when you sell it, less costs to the point of sale. Net realizable value is the future expected sale price, market value, less costs to the point of sale. Um, yeah, so, for example, if you've got an item in stock that you expect to sell for £65,000, um, but it's going to cost you, um, I don't know, £2,000 in, um, uh, in, in marketing expenditure and a further £3,000 in delivery costs, then it's going to cost you five grand to make the sale. If it's going to cost you five grand to make the sale and you're going to get sixty-five in, then you're going to spend five grand to get 65 in, so the NRV is 60. Okay? So, yeah, there you go, NRV. If the cost happened to be 74, then the cost would be 74 and the NRV would be 60, so the stock would said to be said to be impaired or have fallen in value. So, if it was valued at cost at 74, but it should be valued at a, um, a figure of 60, then you'd knock 14 off. The, um, the value of 74, you'd knock it down to 60. And that process, you probably normally call it a stock write down, but you could also call it an inventory impairment if you wanted to. 
So uh, when does that happen? Well, you have problems with stock when it's damaged and uh, when it's obsolete. Uh, when you have a product that's difficult to sell because either people just don't want it, the reduction in the demand, or unfortunately it's damaged. So, yeah, C, part two. State the types of stock which may be worth less than cost. Well, those are the two types. C, one. Damaged stock. Often, damaged goods are worth less than cost. And just so that we're answering this question rather than you know, any question in general, just so that we're answering Silver Hill, which is a pottery business, let's give an example of damaged goods, e.g. broken plates, which one would imagine would have an NRV of zero, right? So broken plates. Uh, so that's damaged stock. And the other one is obsolete stock. Uh, stock that is difficult to sell due to reduced demand is often worth less than stock. Oops, is often worth less than cost. And the normal trick to get rid of that kind of stuff is to slap it in a sale. So, e.g. last year's colours. One would imagine, if we're talking about pottery, that white would always sell. But say that we chose to have an absolutely vibrant uh, orange colour as regards um, some mugs and plates and so forth, and then we tried to sell it. It sold okay last year, but now people's mood has reduced because of a recession in the economy. And the result is that people don't want to buy bright orange anymore. If they don't want to buy bright orange, it's going to be difficult to sell. We may be able to sell it, but we'll probably have to reduce the price. And we'll probably have to reduce the price below cost. Is it worth selling something at below cost? Well, yes, it can still make a contribution to the business, because otherwise we're going to throw it away. So, yes, it's worth selling at less than cost, but it does create a problem for the accountants, and therefore a problem for the auditors. Okay, that's that, uh, which brings us to C part two. How do you spot that kind of problem stock? Now, we're going to wheel out our absolute favourite mnemonic for the whole balance sheet, which is A-E-I-O-U. This mnemonic is classically used to help us generate ideas as regards substantive testing. It isn't exclusive to substantive testing, but it works really well for substantive testing. So it says, C, describe the investigations you'll carry out to identify this stock. So we'll do A, analytical review to identify problem stock. E, inquiry, we'll, make, uh, we'll ask people questions. I, inspection. O, observation. And U, recomputation. We'll just you know, recalculate numbers. So here we go. Remember, this is, well, not remember, read. Describe the investigations you care to identify this stock. We're not trying to value the stock. We're just trying to identify the problem stock. And then C part three is slightly different. Let's read it. Describe the audit work you will carry out to determine the NRV, the value of the problem stock, once you've found it. So part C, part two is identifying the problem stock. Whereas C part 3 is valuing it once you've found it. Okay, here we go. A. Analytical review. Uh, 
Uh, how about this? I would calculate stock days ratio for individual stock lines to highlight problem stock lines uh, stock days is stock divided by cost of sales multiplied by 365 days stock divided by cost of sales multiplied by 365 days and therefore gives you the approximate age of a um, stock line if anything if any of those stock lines are over 30 days then you might look into them especially if they're over 60 or 90 you'd look into them because there may be problems with those particular stock units AE very easy test how do you find a problem you ask E inquiry I would ask the stock supervisor are you aware of any damaged goods and then I would inspect. So just because he says it's damaged doesn't necessarily mean it is damaged. A E I inspection. Um, we did this at the stock take, didn't we? I would inspect oops I would inspect the goods in the warehouse for condition uh, looking out for dust in particular uh, looking out for dust in particular um, I tell you what just to make sure that you are clear on this this is an exam question with an exam answer this is exactly how you answer as I was writing the word dust I was thinking to myself I wonder if they would be confident to write the word dust I mean, talking about looking at condition in a warehouse is all very well. It kind of gives a flavour of what you're looking for. But if you actually say that you're looking for dust, it's so much clearer to the markers that they know what you're looking for. You're looking for dust. If you, say, if you, if you, if you think that you're looking for dust, say that you're looking for dust, and then the markers will know that you're looking for dust, right? Keep it simple. A-E-I-O. Observation. Uh, should we observe the sales team? I would observe the sales team and investigate. any stock they struggle to sell I would observe the um, sales team and investigate any stock they struggle to sell and finally you recomputation 
U. I would recompute the inventory aged analysis and investigate any old stock. I would recompute the inventory age analysis and investigate any old stock. Well, there you see C part 2. I really like this question because in C part 2 it asks you first to identify the problem stock and then once you've identified it, in C part 3 you then value it. And um, I do accept this is a little bit pedantic. But it is how real audit is done. First of all, you look for a problem and then you solve it. That is, <clears throat> that is really how real audit is done. You look for a problem and then you solve it. Um, but the problem with this question was a problem that arose when this was examined. Uh, when this question was examined, a lot of students completely misunderstood the requirements as regards Silver Hill. They kind of jumbled up their answer between C part 2 and C part 3. They talked about identification when they should have been talking about valuation. And they talked about valuation when they should have been talking about identification. Now, I'm sure you're sitting there thinking, I could make that mistake as well. Well, anyone can make that mistake. But that is kind of the problem with F8. As I've mentioned on many occasions, one of the key issues with F8 is making sure that you answer the specific requirement in front of you. Now, when you look at the question Silverhill, have you noticed how this question and previous questions, the scenario kind of almost doesn't really matter, but the requirements are absolutely paramount? Now, it's always true that requirements are really important, but misunderstanding them slightly in a lot of subjects is not catastrophic, but misunderstanding a requirement in audit, in F8, it really is catastrophic. But on the other hand, slightly misunderstanding the scenario hardly seems to matter. So make sure you're aware of this when you are doing questions. So, speaking of questions, back to the question. C, part two, which we've done. Describe the investigations you'll carry out to identify this stock. And C, part three. Describe the audit work you will carry out to determine the NRV of the stock you found from your investigations in C, part two, above. So, let's have a look at that. So, C, part three. You know what I'm going to say, don't you? A, E, I, O, U. Let's wheel out the same mnemonic and this time use it to audit valuation. A, analytical review. You know analytical review is doing any test using your head. Analysis, using your head. So analytical review is looking at things and using your head. So what might one do as regards using one's head to identify the market value for uh, pottery goods, which is what's being examined here? Well, I guess we're going to surf the net. We're going to Google pottery goods. I would surf Competitor websites to get a feel for the market, the market value of goods. I would surf competitor websites to get a feel for the market value of goods. A E Enquiry, just asking. I would 
ask the... How about this? I would ask the production manager. Yeah, let's do that. I would ask the production manager. Do you think damaged goods can be mended? Do you think damaged goods can be mended? Because if not, NRV is zero. Hmm, quite like that. AEI inspection. I inspection. Um, I would inspect sales team uh, guidance to help me to identify the, um, the price that we're trying to achieve. I would inspect sales team guidance. to identify the uh, sale price expected for problem goods. I would inspect sales team guidance to identify the sales price expected for problem goods. Uh, do you recall that NRV is um, the market value basically, the expected selling price, less the costs to the point of sale? We've done AEI and we've done RV, RV, RV. We've done market value, market value and market value. We haven't actually audited the costs to the point of sale. Do you remember that we're supposed to audit the cost to the point of sale? Do you remember I gave the example where we had, I just made up a figure of 65,000. If the market value is 65,000, then you wouldn't value stock at 65,000. You'd have to net off the costs to the point of sale. And in my little story earlier, I used a figure of five grand. So how would you identify a... Um, cost to the point of sale of five grand. Well, should we try and do that? With O. Observation. i tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to observe the uh, problem stock being dispatched. If it's dispatched on our lorries, then I suspect that we are paying for delivery. In which case, the NRV would be net of the delivery costs. I will inspect, inspect? I mean observe, don't I? I will observe problem stock being dispatched to identify who is paying for delivery costs. I will observe problem stock being dispatched to identify who is paying for delivery costs. If we are paying for the delivery costs, then um, uh, if, 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 we, if we are paying for the delivery costs, then those delivery costs need to be set off um, against the market value to give you the NRV. And then you, for recomputation, a really easy one.
recomputation. I will recompute NRV as follows. Um, RV market value. RV is realizable value, by the way. We use 65,000 as our example, so I'll use the word say. So that's 65,000 say, and then uh, costs to sale. That's future costs to the point of sale. We use the figure of five. That's things like the delivery costs. Gives us an NRV of 60. And um, that's a calculation, right? And people make mistakes with calculations. Can I tell you what the classic mistake is as regards calculating NRV? Um, the uh, realizable value is 65, isn't it? And the costs to the point of sale, like delivery costs, they're five in my little story. So the NRV is 60. But it's really common when people are calculating NRV, they're not really quite sure what they're doing. So instead of deducting the costs to the point of sale, they add them. So they end up with an NRV of 70, which is obviously wrong but it's an arithmetic mistake that you could imagine yourself making. I could certainly imagine me making that mistake. If I could imagine myself making that mistake, then I check others to see if they have made that mistake. And that's called a recomputation test. Okay, there's a lovely question. I'm very fond of that question, Silver Hill. So we've now covered the angles as regards stock. There are three issues, I suppose you would say, as regards stock. The first one that we covered is very important, if a little bit boring. Uh, that's the subject of the stock count or the stock take. Uh, and then this particular question, Silver Hill, covers cut-off and NRV valuation. So those are the three main subjects as regards stock.